Good afternoon, everyone. We want to start on time because we have one hour and plenty of speakers. So please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please. So, well, thank you very much for joining us on this open forum. It's a, our UNESCO's open forum about measuring a free, open, right-based, rights-based, and inclusive internet. It's an honor for us to welcome you here. We have wonderful speakers around the table and in this wonderful room. And we want to explain how we assess the internet universality. We elaborated these indicators for a purpose, and it is, please. So we elaborated these indicators with a lot of engagement from different organizations, from different stakeholders in different countries and around the world. And we are really pleased to, to, to present the speak uh, uh, around the table, different speakers from different perspectives from different countries that we talk about how important it is. And uh, of course, it's our pleasure at UNESCO, you know, our role with internet governance how is important because we believe that it is uh, an important, uh, m um, and our mandate to engage with different stakeholders and to deal with internet governance issues when it comes to internet development. Because as UNESCO is, is, is a, a United Nations organization, an intergovernmental inter uh, agency under the United Nations umbrella, we work on internet governance since the beginning, since 2005 when the IGF was established. And we are really happy as we, our member states approved the internet universality principles, accessible, openness, rights-based, and multi-stakeholder we now bringing these indicators with the road with the, all our experts to be exposed and to be presented to you and to present to member states in uh, in, in uh, next week i think with the ipdc council the ipdc is an, an, uh, is important because it's an anti-governmental program that we use to actually to work on these indicators so i don't want to be long because we have plenty of speakers and i expect that there is a lot of questions especially from different stakeholders participating in this IGF. And uh, welcome to UNESCO, welcome to this IGF. Uh, so I, I will be happy to introduce David Suter, which is the commission and author for Internet Universality Indicators. Then I will give the floor to our panel, starting by Enrico Calandro, research manager, research ICT Africa from South Africa. Then as we are pilot, as we did some pilots in three countries, including Brazil, Senegal, and Thailand, I will be happy to, to give the floor to our colleagues from uh, Brazil, uh, Alexandra Barbosa and uh, Mr. Juan Brandt. Uh, Alexandra is the head of the Center of Studies for Information and Communications Technology, CITIC.br, and Mr. Juan Brandt, consultant for the implementation of the UNESCO's Internet Universality Indicators Framework in Brazil. Uh, I don't know if uh, Miss uh, Pring Grong is here. She's he okay, she will be, she will join us later on. So she's from Thailand and she is a member of the content broad broadcaster section, national broadcasting and telecommunication from Thailand. And uh, then I will give the floor to my left, Miss uh, Sylvia Grundman, head of media and internet division and secretary of CDMCI. CDMCI. Yeah, uh, from Council of Europe. And then we open the floor for questions, and we look forward to have a, a lot of questions from you. And, the, and at the end, we will close the session by Ms. Alabana Shala, the chair of Intergovernmental Program for Development of Communication. And uh, she will maybe highlight how important it is for IPDC to develop this, for these indicators. I don't want to take so much time for your time, and I will give the floor directly to Ms. Suter to talk us, uh, to, 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 to present the indicators. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, I've been asked to spend no more than five or six or seven minutes uh, introducing the document, so I will be brief. Uh, I'll try not to speak too fast. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to thank UNESCO uh, for the opportunity to work on, uh, on this project, which I hope you'll agree is an important new initiative, and also to thank APC, the Association for Progressive Communications, which coordinated the project. And I'd like to thank my research partner, Henri van der Spee, uh, for the work she's done alongside me uh, with, uh, on it, which has been invaluable. Um, 
The project's rooted in two established UNESCO initiatives. Um, in the media development indicators, which have been used to assess media development in some 30 countries now, uh, over the past decade or so, uh, and also in the Internet Universality Approach, which was adopted by UNESCO's General Council a few years back now, four or five years ago. Um, and that Internet Universality Framework roots the future of the internet as UNESCO envisages it in rights, openness, accessibility to all and multi-stakeholder participation. So the purpose of this, um, uh, of this indicator framework is to help governments and other stakeholders to do three things. Uh, firstly, to develop a clear understanding of the na national internet environment in which they're working. And then secondly, to assess how well that national environment conforms with UNESCO's Rome principles. So with those the principles and commitment to rights, openness, accessibility to all, and multi-stakeholder participation. And thirdly, to develop policy approaches and practical interventions that will enable a national government, a national internet community, to meet those goals more effectively. The indicator framework is not, and I would stress this, it's not intended to compare countries with one another or to draw up league tables of countries. It's for a much more sophisticated and substantive uh, approach at national level in understanding um, and developing appropriate policies. And its focus is on the accurate gathering of evidence to enable progress, uh, collaborative progress towards those goals rather than on advocacy. I'll say something briefly about three things then. Uh, first about the way the indicators were developed, then about the structure of the indicator framework, and thirdly about their future implementation. So developing the indicators has been a scientific and rigorous process. Uh, they build on a wide range of established work and resources which have been put together over the years by a wide range of actors, by United Nations and other intergovernmental agencies, by governments, by research centers, by academic bodies, by businesses, by civil society, and by internet professional groups. Um, could go back to the project timeline slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, there have been two extensive consultation processes involved. So the first was on general principles, and the second on a first draft of the indicators. And in each of those phases, more than 200 uh, contributions were uh, received and discussed. Many governments and other stakeholders contributed, and they made substantial detailed comments which were taken into account as the indicators were developed. And the development of these indicators has also been informed by dialogue within UNESCO, uh, with UNESCO's Institute for Statistics, with other UN agencies, and a multi-stakeholder advisory board of international experts. The indicators which are in the document have also been rigorously tested, and we'll be hearing about that shortly. Firstly, they were, there were four pre-tests, um, which were uh, intended to validate the, the extent to, to the viability of gathering and analyzing data for the indicators that, were, uh, that are proposed. And then after that, there were three part pilots in which uh, research partners uh, took a core set of core indicators, about a third of the entire framework, um, and assessed those within particular countries. So it's this rigorously tested set of indicators that is, being, is going to be presented to UNESCO's IPDC Council next week. Now, some words about the structure. Uh, these diagrams are taken uh, from the booklet, so you can see them in there. But the indicators are in five groups. There are the four Rome categories of rights, openness, accessibility to all, and multi-stakeholder participation. And then an additional category of cross-cutting indicators, which is concerned with gender, children, sustainable development, trust and security, and legal and ethical aspects of the internet. Within each category, there are a number of themes uh, which are illustrated on this slide here. And I don't have time to go through these as I might uh, otherwise have done in detail now, but I'll leave this slide up at the end of, uh, of my remarks so that you can look more carefully at what, uh, uh, what is included in those themes. And they will be, I should have looked up the page number. They're on um, page 14 uh, of, the, of the booklet. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, um, each theme includes a number of questions, and each question is associated with one or more indicators. And together, these questions and indicators address the whole range of issues with which internet universality is concerned. 
Finally, within the document, we've included recommended sources for these indicators, um, which um, uh, um, are a guide for the use of researchers, and they, these will vary quite significantly from country to country. The indicators we've included in the framework can be divided into three main types. Uh, some are concerned with the existence and practical implementation of institutions or legal arrangements. Some are quantitative measurements, some are qualitative assessments. And the evidence that's available across this range uh, is obviously going to vary considerably between countries. Some countries will have much more evidence than others. Some data in some countries will be more timely, more reliable, more extensive than equivalent data in other countries. In some cases where data are available for a number of years, it will be much easier to establish trends. In every case, though, it's going to be important for researchers to look critically and carefully at the evidence base which is available, uh, to assess why that evidence is available, what it says, when it says it about, and what it implies for future, uh, for future policy and practical interventions. Now, there are a lot of indicators in this framework, and that's deliberate uh, because it helps to address the diversity and, in, many, in, in some cases, the deficiency of data available. So the framework as a whole should provide a collage of evidence which is sufficiently substantial to allow a serious assessment of current circumstances and policy options in almost every country. We've suggested a number of contextual indicators too, um, which are concerned with issues like development and demography. Um, these don't form part of the framework itself, but they're intended to help with the contextualization of findings uh, and the policy prescriptions which are developed for particular national circumstances. Um, so a few words finally concerning implementation, and I've put back the, um, the slide now which shows the categories and themes. Implementation is going to be a substantial exercise, uh, and we'll hear experience for that, uh, from that on the partial pilots shortly. Um, and it's going to require significant resources. Uh, UNESCO hopes that most assessments will make use of the whole indicator framework, but equally recognizes that this won't be possible in every case. And for that reason, we've also prepared a subset of core indicators, which includes about a third of the indicators in the comprehensive framework, um, and includes indicators from every theme within that framework. So it, it draws right across the entire range. There's no specific model proposed as to who should undertake assessments. Uh, anyone and everyone who's is invited or is, is to be invited to make use of them. However, UNESCO believes that it is valuable to involve diverse stakeholder groups and diverse perspectives on the internet among those who are involved in any research team. Uh, because that would encourage deeper and more open investigation, uh, more discussion of diverse perspectives, which should lead to better understanding and better outcomes. Um, and finally, to facilitate all of this, an implementation guide is now in preparation, and that should be published around the end of the year. So thanks for your attention, and I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for your all. Your, 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 you're really presenting it in a very, very quick manner, and this is, you know, it's the sake of time, but all the indicators, all the slides that are presented are available in the book, that is, you can get at them. Uh, first, before giving the floor to my next speaker, I would like also to have to thank the, the, our donor, or they are supporting uh, the, this work, and uh, especially I want to thank the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA, the Internet Society, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, the Brazilian Network Information Center, NIC.BA, and the Latin American and Caribbean Network Information Center, LACNIC. Uh, for their support for this project. You know that we involved more than uh, 2,000 uh, experts worldwide, and it took us 18 months to work with all different stakeholders to, to achieve this, all these indicators uh, that was presented briefly by um, uh, Dr. Suter. And I also to thank the APC consortium with uh, David Suter to, that helped us to, to achieve these uh, indicators. So let's move uh, to our next speaker, Mr. Rico Calandro, research manager, research ICT Africa from South Africa. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, UNESCO, for uh, giving us the opportunity of sharing our experience uh, of conducting the pre-testing of the Internet Universality Indicators in Nigeria and the piloting in, um, in Senegal. 
Um, as David uh, mentioned, uh, the objective of the pretesting in Nigeria uh, was to uh, determine how feasible uh, would be to implement the internet universality indicators in the, uh, in the country. And to do that, we, from a methodological perspective, we have a two-pronged uh, approach. Uh, we conducted some desk research, uh, which aimed at reviewing the indicators, if they were available already in the country, uh, locate potential sources, uh, their credibility, and were not available, the likelihood of these indicators to be available or accessible in future. Uh, the second approach, um, uh, we conducted some um, key informant interviews uh, with members uh, of the internet stakeholder community in, uh, uh, in Nigeria from the public, civil society and private sector. And uh, they were considered as uh, highly knowledgeable people uh, in this subject, uh, subject matter. Uh, and one of the main uh, stakeholders was also the Nigerian Communication Commission because it's uh, one of the main actors in the country uh, that has got the mandate of collecting uh, ICT indicators in the country, is the telecommunications regulator. Okay, so uh, one of the main results of this um, pretesting is that currently it is actually difficult uh, to collect um, these uh, UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators. Um, According to our uh, researcher uh, on the field, only 18% of these indicators uh, were actually readily accessible in Nigeria. Then it divided uh, the remaining indicator in 40%. It would be difficult uh, to locate and retrieve uh, in the form and structure requested by the uh, Internet Universality Indicators. And 41 were actually considered almost impossible to, call, to locate under the current circumstances in the, in, in the country. Um, there are a few reasons for uh, this uh, evaluation. Uh, as I said, first of all, the non-availability of primary data. So um, where indicators were actually identified, uh, it was very difficult to perform advanced analytics as required by the, um, by the, the framework. For instance, uh, very difficult to do uh, disaggregation by demographics, by different location, urban, rural and uh, the no longitudinal data also exist across these different demographics. And where household surveys uh, are conducted in the country, for instance, we research as have conducted the, the survey last year, uh, these kind of uh, initiatives are actually sporadic, so they are not uh, done every, every year. There are also some data access and collection uh, challenges. Uh, so it seems uh, that there is lack of awareness among, the, uh, among state uh, officials of the importance and benefits of collecting ICT uh, indicators. And the public available um, uh, databases come only with basic uh, indicators. So they do not have all these nuances and that uh, that is currently in the, um, in the framework. Um, data collect uh, collection also should involve uh, um, state agency. And somehow, some, somehow in, in Nigeria was constrained by um, hoarding and red tape. So uh, also in the country uh, there is a Freedom of Information Act which grants rights to the citizen to access publicly public data. Um, not always public officials feel that they, they have to comply um, with, with that. So there is also somehow some general unwillingness um, of state officials to make uh, this data publicly available and, um, and accessible. And then another reason uh, for difficulties uh, conducting this kind of research is the, access, uh, the absence uh, of, the local, uh, of a local research um, on the ICT sector um, in Nigeria. So there is uh, not a strong institutional capacity, uh, lack of technical knowledge of these issues, and as I said, there is not uh, disaggregated um, data. Um, with regards to the uh, pilot um, exercise in Senegal, um, the, the researcher reached um, similar uh, conclusions. Uh, what it did uh, was an investigation of the uh, national internet environment, uh, making use of, the, of a selection of the indicators. So it used uh, the core indicators in the respect of the uh, ROA uh, X categories, as uh, presented by David, and the full set of indicators for the uh, M categories. And he identified similar uh, problems. So there are also a few recommendations that actually um, we, uh, we made on how to move things forward. Uh, we believe that there should be a need for a dedicated entity 
uh, that should be established uh, potentially by UNESCO to actually gather in-country data and also develop primary uh, research because not always available and to formally involve the public sector uh, from the onset, so since the beginning of the uh, exercise. And then it's also very important to identify uh, and appoint a central coordinator uh, within the government, uh, within the uh, government and public institution, and potentially also to consider to reduce the number of depth of indicators, especially in, uh, in developing countries. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Riku, for uh, giving us uh, these uh, feedbacks about the pre-testing in African countries. You know that Africa is a priority for UNESCO, and we believe that uh, these indicators need to be implemented. It's not just a theory that we need to just endorse, and just we need to support the member states later on and the way to assess all these indicators. And this is part of our duty now as UNESCO. Once these indicators will be endorsed, we will be, our, our work will start to support member states, different member states. And this, this pre-testing among the, these different countries is in order to at least to assess the complexity and the feasibility of this, uh, actually, of this goal. Okay, next, I will be, I'll give the floor directly to Mr. Alexander Barboza, our friend from CITIC.br. It's a really an engagement with uh, Brazil, with UNESCO on, on these topics, and I will be uh, happy to, to listen to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, I would like to uh, thank UNESCO for having invited uh, NIC.br, the Brazilian Network Information Center, and CETIC to be, to be represented in this uh, important session. It is indeed a great uh, pleasure to be able to share with you our experience in implementing UNESCO's universality, uh, internet universality indicators. I also would like to say that we were involved in this uh, project since the very beginning. In this very same IGF meeting in 2013 in Bali, uh, UNESCO, Mercosur, LACNIC, and NIC.br started a conversation on the importance of developing a framework and a set of indicators to measure internet development in countries. And the result of this conversation was that NIC.br and LACNIC decided to finance the first concept note document that was later on presented in a consultation uh, meeting during the Net Mundial in 2013 in Sao Paulo. Uh, and in the past two years, NIC.br and CETIC, uh, along with UNESCO, have coordinated regional and national public consultations of the Rome framework. Uh, and we have also conducted the pretest and the pilot of these uh, un internet universality indicators in Brazil. Uh, I do acknowledge that the Rome framework and the proposed indicators are relevant uh, to measure the internet development and are, are also at the same time uh, of high policy relevance since they constitute an excellent tool for countries to produce data that are relevant for advancing human rights uh, on the internet. And also, uh, I would mention freedom of speech, right to access to public information, personal data protection, among others. But they are also important to produce relevant data for the UN 2030 Sustainable Development um, Agenda. And the most stakeholder internet governance model in Brazil, represented by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br and NIC.br, and also their commitment uh, with regular data production on ICT statistics were two key success factors uh, for this exercise uh, in Brazil. This exercise was really important not only to understand the feasibility of data collection of, in all four dimensions that David has just uh, presented of the Rome framework, but also to better understand the role and the capacity of different stakeholders in providing access to reliable data sources, both quantitative and qualitative, as you will see uh, that is requi required in the framework. To conclude, I would like to say that this exercise revealed the relevance of the Rome framework, not only for policymakers to decide about policies and legislation fostering internet development, but also for civil society, organizations, academia, and I would say for the society as a role, as a whole. I will now uh, pass uh, to Mr. João Brandi, who was the consultant for both uh, pre-test 
and the pilot in Brazil during the data collection, and also for formatting, along with CETIC, the final report that was submitted by us to UNESCO. Thank you, Alexandre. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll actually, we'll reinforce four uh, issues that I think it's important to highlight in this opportunity. Firstly, the opportunity to rely on robust institutions. Uh, the application, of course, will be better the more robust the agency responsible for measuring primary data on access and use of ISTs. We had the opportunity to work with CETIC and Nick BR, part of the structure of the steering committee in Brazil, uh, which really made things easier. So uh, for those who are not so lucky, the application itself may help defining or amplifying the scope of an agency of measurement and statistics. So I would take the, the, the indicators also as an opportunity to enhance uh, the domestic conditions and, and structure. The second issue is the application will be better the larger the network of organizations and specialists that can be referenced as a source in the country based on, of course, evidence-based assessments. We really got benefit of a strong Brazilian civil society organizations, and I'd like to thank all the Brazilian civil society organizations that really contributed to this report, and it was very important as well. And I think, of course, in, in, this, in the country like Brazil, uh, it changes and enhances the, the report having this opportunity. Uh, third issue, I would reinforce the idea of participation and engaging uh, civil society and academia and private sector players in this, this, this debate. So we had in time in this pilot application to do validation process or previous debates, but I would reinforce this is, uh, of course, uh, makes a, a, a report and application stronger. Uh, finally, some issues of challenges and opportunities that uh, we had and we faced uh, during the implementation process. Uh, firstly, it's necessary to avoid the confirmation bias of the researchers. So, of course, it's also a risk, it's always a risk in, in, in researches like this. Uh, and this involves dealing with credible and verifiable sources. I would, it's a strong recommendation that comes from UNESCO, but I would like to reinforce it. Uh, secondly, in large countries as Brazil, uh, we have different federative levels with different realities. So it's important to define beforehand the scope of application. In our case, it was a national scope only. Uh, third issue, the absence of sources and data available. Uh, I would then uh, 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 reinforce the idea that we have to use the process to improve collection and organization of data in the country by official bodies and NGOs. We did uh, recommendations to government and to civil society after the, the application as a way to feedback and to get a, 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 a stronger uh, uh, framework for application the next time. And finally, I would only reinforce that the application is not only a form of getting benefit of, of the indicators. What these indicators create is a common ground and an internationally validated framework that can and must uh, be used as an advocacy tool for human rights and for an open internet. So I would like to uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and to uh, thank also CETIC and Nick for the opportunity of applying that in Brazil. Thank you very much. I just want to recall that CETIC.pr is a center to cat category two center of UNESCO and is engaging in different, different work plans with UNESCO. And so I want to thank, thank you again because you're providing very good support to CI, especially, and uh, let's, we're looking forward to more engagement. Yeah, last but not least, our last uh, speaker on the, on the pre-testing, Ms. Um, Pirong Grong, yeah, from Thailand. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, UNESCO, for letting me take part in this uh, really interesting and very insightful exercise into um, uh, uh, the internet as uni uh, universal resource. Um, I'm a social science researcher who has worked extensively on internet freedom and rights. So uh, much of my um, talk today will deal with um, the right, which is the R, in the ROAM. Overall, we find the Rome framework provides a workable and overarching scheme, grouping a broad range of factors that shape the internet development as a universal resource. But based on the experience of the pilot of the IUI in Thailand, in which extensive best research was carried out, alongside interviews with 20 key informants from policy making, regulatory, industry, academic, and civil society sectors, we have a number of interesting findings in terms of applicability of the IUI to a national context, and we have selected a few to share with you today. 
First, why we find that the UNESCO's posited indicators on rights and are aptly tackle the core components of rights and freedom that are related to the internet as a fundamental resource. We also detect a constant tendency to seek answers about existence of legal framework that enable human rights or the existence of restrictions on rights and freedom using international right agreements as benchmarks. For our, for our piloting team, our researchers were not clear as to what extent and in what nature the report should be would be sufficiently substantiated on this point. To answer yes or no to, to the question which is framed as is there or are there, or to give some statistics showing quantitative evidence of certain practice would be sufficient grammatically and semantically from our point of view. And it would not do justice to understanding of rights-based scenarios if there is no qualitative information or even a story to help unravel the complexity and uniqueness of each national situation. This explains why a great deal of information in the Thai piloting report is qualitative and painstaking account of actual cases. And this is particularly true in the post-2014 coup context. We had a coup in 2014 and we're still um, living under this so-called democratic pause. Um, anyway, in the post-coup context, um, the security state prevails over everything and we have witnessed draconian laws, old and new, became more intensified in use and consequences to curb freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, despite the fact that there are constitutional provisions available on these issues. Secondly, for the IUI questions that assess the openness or O of the ROM of the Thai internet ecosystem, our team find that the question listed under the O umbrella appear quite fragmented as they address so many aspects of openness that may not necessarily interconnect or coalesce with one another. Evidently, these questions are meant to assess openness from multifaceted dimensions. Open standards for accessibility, competition, regulatory independence, transparency, net neutrality, and availability of diverse service options, among others. In so doing, they lack coherence and do not seem to address a single issue. Thirdly, under the multi-stakeholder or M indicator, our researchers have qualms about positing ICANN as an exemplar of multi-stakeholder forum for internet governance. While the structure of ICANN may allow for participation at various levels, apart from the, the, the GAC, the GAC, a country-specific situation and factors that may influence this participation, be it financial, linguistic, political, and cultural, are not sufficiently recognized in the IUI. Based on the unique context of Thailand and from various information and resources reviewed and encountered in this piloting exercise, our team has proposed that this additional themes and questions be included in the IUI. First, enabling factors or elements that shape digital or internet com competency. Second, government spending on online media production or promotion of digital media creation. Third, indicator or, ev or evidence of privacy awareness online and offline. Fourth, indicators or evidence of online activism or youth, activity, or youth activities to create significant social change. In addition, the research team also suggests that UNESCO identify a few key questions, uh, a, a few key and top questions in order to, for the research team, which have limited time and resource, uh, that, so that they can opt to tackle this smaller set of questions first and later grow the assessment to the full set of questions when the resource is permitted. The team also recommends a shelf life of the assessment for each question. Some questions may have a shelf life of one year. This means assessment needs not, to, needs not be done yearly to ensure its utmost reliability. Some questions may have a longer shelf life and need not be updated as frequently. The shelf life will help the future research team by better prioritize their tasks with available resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you see that we have performed in four countries, two in Africa, one Brazil, one Thailand, from different regions, this pre-testing. And of course, we will collecting and, and uh, analyzing all these responses from the, from the field. And of course, we're discussing them with the member states next week on IPDC 
uh, Council. And this is very important for us because we want the uh, internet to be universal. And we want to not, to, to, not, to, to not promote any fragmentation on the internet. We need to be, have the same understanding. Of course, there are some difficulties to understand some of these, these indicators. One indicator can engage a lot of work from UNESCO. So this is why we want to have the same un, un, un understanding. And of course, to, 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 to determine and together the best methodology how to assess these indicators, how to implement them in different countries, in different contexts. And I know that different countries in other regions, on the same regions, have different contexts, and they could be very sensitive to some implementation of these indicators. But we are here in UNESCO to engage with the member states, to engage with all stakeholders in these countries in order to achieve our goals, to achieve this universality and to, and to assess the right development of the internet. Okay, so I know that on the left, and my friend, um, Ms. Sylvia Grundman from Council of Europe, I want to please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I would like to begin uh, just uh, congratulating and share my impression uh, and, yeah, to this excellent initiative and to this very deep drill and this extremely thorough multi-stakeholder dialogue. I'm, I'm greatly impressed. And I would like to underline that we at the Council of Europe share the same approach, namely uh, working with indicators, but our uh, document is a lot more modest. So this is what ours looks like. Please compare it to this initiative, which is a global one. So, um, but like um, I said, we share the same approach and I would uh, like to underline what David has said, said, namely that this is a voluntary exercise. And thereby, this is an opportunity for all states and for civil society alike to engage into dialogue and to actually keep the internet open and free. And this is why it is so valuable that we all team up and see how we can make good use of the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators and also using the Council of Europe Internet Freedom Recommendation to support such indicators. Because in the UNESCO initiative, one of the means to verify the compliance with the UNESCO indicators is benchmarking it against our modest document, against our indicators. Now you wonder, indicators, indicators. Yes, the Council of Europe is a pan-European organization with 47 member states, so having the big, big Europe on board, but we address mainly member states. We reach out to civil society in a structured dialogue to produce policy recommendations that then go to the member states and invite them to follow them, for instance, when they make laws. So better lawmaking, there you can use our Council of Europe recommendations and you can use them globally, should you like so, to do so. Now, um, our recommendations are very much based on the law of the European Court for Human Rights. So we distill the court's case law Again, this can be a source of um, inspiration for everybody. Now, the UNESCO indicators are very much complementary and they are, they are a, a lot larger uh, in scope and also, as I said, globally. So they reach out into all wakes of society and this is the value of such indicators and as we've just learned, in some countries, it's only 18% of the indicators that are accessible. But that is also quite telling, because if that is the case, that should make everybody think why it is like that. There might be good reasons for it, that's okay, but probably if you cannot come up with convincing explanations, that is also telling. So therefore, I find the methodology extremely convincing and I see that this mutual reinforcement at the level of, of two big international organizations can lead to synergies. 
So therefore, what I will do is I will present this initiative to my stakeholders, to our Council of Europe member states, in my specific committee, where I service government experts at the highest level. So that way we feed in the UNESCO indicators already at a certain policy-making level, and I will invite them to reflect on how to implement the indicators. And then at the next step, and I'll do that already in November, and then at the next step, I'd like to have UNESCO colleagues with me in June to address our government high-level experts and to ask them, what are your reflections so that we can to come to some concrete results in the implementation? Thank you. Thank you. The reason that we invited you is also to highlight how important that we work together. It's not just we are inventing the wheel here in UNESCO. We are working with different organizations and we joined our effort together to achieve our goals. And this is very, very important to highlight how it is valuable to work together. Thank you very much. So this is um, the first part of our, uh, this, for this open forum. I will open the floor to some to questions. If you have any question to our uh, panelists, I don't know if you can, if you want to could just raise your hands. Yes, please, sir. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Mark Nelson from the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, I was curious about how much these uh, indicators are designed to be comparable from one country to the other and, and used over time. Is it just a study at the country level? To what extent does it go into regional differences and whether or not it, uh, they're comparable over time? And Is there another question? So we can take uh, the question and then give the floor to the panelists. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to firstly to congratulate all panelists. I'm uh, Councillor Murilo Vieira Komuniski, representing the delegation of Brazil to UNESCO. Uh, one uh, issue I would like if you could, uh, if all panelists could uh, further explore if possible, uh, if, uh, is uh, up to what extent the very issue of uh, um, access to information and the gap uh, between rich and poor in access to internet uh, was uh, focused uh, in this report. Uh, and, and also what would be the, the best way to, to address the issue under the perspective of, uh, of the panelists and, uh, and of course, uh, of, the, of the DG. So thank you very much. Is there another question? Otherwise, I will uh, give the floor to... Okay. David, we have two questions. Um, and I will be commenting. So, I mean, uh, firstly, um, on the issue of... Um, the difficulty and uh, the challenge that there is in uh, obtaining data in, in some of the um, in some of the indicators, uh, and in certain countries, more much more than others. Um, and as, as I tried to say in the introduction, this is, um, in a sense, this is this is in a sense by design. Um, that the um, it is because it is challenging and difficult to obtain data in many. Uh, in many countries for certain areas that we need to have a substantial range of indicators from which it is possible for in each country to select some that will enable evidence to be brought together. So the response to a lack of evidence should not be we, don't, we can't do evidence-based policy making. The response to a lack of evidence should be what evidence is available and how do we make most use of it? And secondly, what do we do to ensure that there is better evidence in future? So that, in, in the, the sense that that's how that should be, uh, that, that set of issues should be seen. Um, they're not intended for comparison between countries. Sorry, I can't, I can't remember where that question came from in, around the room. Uh, they're not intended for, right, for comparison between countries. That's, that's very explicit. There are lots of other indicator sets that are intended to do that. These aren't. Uh, like the media development indicators, they're Specific, they're, they're directly about analyzing a particular national environment in its own terms. Um, and in ter uh, as for over time, I think, I mean, yes, it would be very useful if things like, if investigations like this were done on a periodic basis, say every five years or so. I might add on in, in those terms, I think that um, UNESCO acknowledges that the nature of change in the uh, internet world is so rapid that 
it will be necessary to review these indicators in, say, five years' time anyway, because there will be other things that should be in by then. Um, in terms of uh, the issues around access, I mean, the accessibility for all section covers those access issues um, and enables them to be done in a nuanced and disaggregated way where the uh, where data are available to be sufficiently nuanced and disaggregated and encourages thinking at least about that if, if, if not. Um, uh, and so access was specifically what you mentioned. Did, there was one other point you mentioned, I think. Uh, yes, so I mean the, the disaggregation is the disaggregation that is suggested uh, covers a, a wide range of differences and, uh, and that uh, does include income and educational uh, gaps, yeah. Yeah. To also comment about the benchmarking issues, we in UNESCO, we are not really interested in rankings countries, member states. This is very important to, to, to know. Our objective is to map the development of these countries, country by country because the situation is different. We are not interested in saying, okay, these countries are good, and this is country is bad, and then, you know, the polarization that we can do, <laughs> we can see afterwards. The most important thing is to map all those countries when it comes to these indicators. It's a very com comprehensive set of indicators. We cannot see one indicator apart from the others. It's comprehensive. And at the same time, the most important thing is to raise awareness of how to access them and how to improve them they, in the country level with all the stakeholders, with, within the, 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 the involvement and the engagement of the government and, of course, with the support of UNESCO in the field. And this is how we see these indicators. It's not our objective, it's not to say these countries are really bad or enemies of freedom or safe or whatever when it comes to human rights. No, not, not at all. I know that there is some maybe other indicators or maybe other organizations doing that or NGOs or whatever. For us, the most important thing is to map these indicators and to show the situation to, for the member states on how they are developing, how they are achieving these indicators. And this is very important to understand. Good. I think we wrap up on, uh, in this first part of this session. Yeah, time is going on. We are perfectly on time. So I give the floor to our friend, the chair of IPDC, Ms. Alabana. To, for the closing remarks of this first part, then I will give the floor to the second part, which will be the launch of our uh, manual on disinformation. Please, Mr. Alabana, please. Um, thank you, ADG, for giving the floor. Uh, distinguished delegates, excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, talking about internet today is talking about the elephant in the room. There was an exhibition in Boston a few months ago and it was picking the internet apart. So how can we pick apart a big elephant in the room that is moving fast? And we have been trying to do that in the past hour with distinguished speakers who have talked about how can we describe but also make policy when it comes to the way of how, of the kind of internet we want. The kind of internet we want is basically to saying the kind of society we want the kind of future we want, the kind of leaders we want, the kind of youth we want. So it is all connected. And as such, the program that I chair, the International Program for Development of Communication, has played a modest role in promoting this discussion. Um, Sylvia put forward that, that little folder. Uh, this is a folder, another folder about the program. It is comprised of 39 member states, members of UNESCO and of UN. And it is the only UN program mandated, multi, multi forum, multilateral forum in the UN system mandated to mobilize the international community to discuss and promote communications and the development of communications all over the world. It is time maybe for the program to change its name into digital communications because indeed this is the kind of world we're living today. Now, uh, Responding to the rise of this digital age, the IPDC members have been deciding and taking forward the concept of internet universality. And based on the discussions there, further it was, it was agreed during the UNESCO's, UNESCO's 38 general conference to move and to see how these uh, indicators are applicable. Uh, what, what I would... I think many, many issues have been said, but what, what I would like to point out that might be relevant uh, as a closing remarks for this session is that uh, it, these are research instruments, uh, that these are instruments that can be used by governments, but as well as other stakeholders. 
within their national uh, landscapes. These are instruments, as it was pointed by the previous speaker, that they provide an opportunity to enhance and to improve the situation, and that is also worth noting, taking with us. And as a, a body that is dedicated to the development of communication, uh, these are uh, the instruments and the indicators are also about public access to information and fundamental freedoms. And this brings us to the SDGs, especially 1610. Now, next week, the Council will gather and uh, these indicators and the pilots will be discussed and will be presented and we hope that the Member States uh, will agree to endorse these indicators so that uh, there will be even more interested Member States to, uh, to do this exercise. Another thing that is worth mentioning again and again is that this is a voluntary process, so uh, it will have to reflect the willingness of the Member States to build on the indicators as they did with the media development indicators. Um, and finally, I would like to thank uh, UNESCO's Freedom of Expression section and the IPDC team that have organized 41 face-to-face -face consultations with 2,000 experts, as well as I would like to thank the member states that have put forward 300 contributions about, in, and they were engaged during the consultations, uh, the consultation process developing the indicators in the past 18 months. Um, I certainly believe that uh, if we manage to endorse the indicate, indicators, we will have more of a common ground at local and international level where we can advocate for more freedom, for more rights, for more participation, and uh, we can promote good practices. And that is at the core of, of IPDC's work as well. And this will not concern only us, it will concern the youth, it will concern our children, it will also concern the people, the marginalized and the ones who are not yet even on internet as we speak. So uh, IPDC looks forward to working with all of you in this endeavor. And let me thank uh, our main donor for this effort, which is the Swedish government, and as well as the APC consortium for all the efforts, and our main consultant, David Stauter, for the crucial support that you have been giving to this project, as well as ISOC, ICANN, NIC Brazil, and LACNIC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I would like to close in this, this, uh, this uh, session. Thank Ravana uh, personally and all the speakers to be here to intervene. And this make a good transition to the next second part of this open forum. I give the floor directly to my colleague, Guy, to, to moderate this second part. Uh, thank you, Moes. And uh, in case you thought this session was only about measuring the internet, uh, it's fake news. There is another part. <laughs> but before I start with the other part, Please take a hard copy of this Internet Indicators draft publication. There are copies out there. So the second part of this uh, event is the launch of this book, uh, which was uh, commissioned uh, through uh, the Secretariat. Uh, IPDC uh, supported the costs of this because it's concerned with uh, education of journalists. And two uh, editors were appointed to uh, collect and develop this book which is called Journalism, Fake News and Disinformation. And there are hard copies here and you can also download it uh, free. Now, one of the editors is here with us and this is Julie Possetti who works currently for the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in uh, Oxford, uh, the UK. And uh, Julie, I want to ask you a couple of questions about this book and then we'll sort of officially launch it into the air. So the first question is the titles, Journalism, Fake News and Disinformation, and the word fake news is crossed out. It's very strange to have a book title with a term crossed out. Why is fake news crossed out in the title? For two key reasons. The first reason is that it's essentially an oxymoron. Uh, fake news. Um, if it is news, that is, if it's uh, verifiable information uh, produced and shared in the public interest, it's not fake. 
And secondly, um, and most importantly, because all around the world, from liberal democracies to the other end of the spectrum, we are seeing political leaders weaponize this term and use it to target journalists and independent journalism as a way of chilling critical reporting, as a way of uh, trying to circumvent the exposure of a whole range of um, public interest issues. And so we determined that we need to move the conversation along. As uh, my colleague Claire Wardle, who did a major report for the Council of Europe, um, uh, wrote about information disorders, um, we need to come up with new language and new ways of talking about this crisis. It's, it's a very serious issue, um, and we cannot see this term deployed in a way that undermines um, a ro the role of journalism that's fundamental to sustaining open societies. Okay, thank you. So I know that in the book it also makes a strong point that weak journalism is not uh, disinformation. No, um, there's, that's true. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> and, and, and journalism we don't agree with yeah. is not disinformation. Disinformation is something else. That's right. Um, so, you know, you could think about three categories um, of, disinform of disinformation or what used to be under the umbrella of um, fake news. Um, one is misinform misinformation, that's something that is shared uh, perhaps without ill intent or inadvertently or unwittingly shared that is not correct. Um, disinformation, which is deliberately um, constructed falsehood that is shared with a particular purpose. And then there's malinformation, which again is a term that um, was coined by uh, Claire Wardle from Harvard and First Draft to describe a process of um, information with malicious intent. So that could be a mix of accurate information and disinformation shared with malicious intent. And we see that manifesting, I think, most potently and urgently in the context of um, disinformation campaigns that are um, driven via social media but uh, are often state-sponsored um, that target journalists, and in particular um, female journalists, with a view to trying to dis uh, misrepresent them um, and cause disrepute. Um, as, as uh, in the context of um, their reporting on issues that are critical of governments, for example. Okay, thank you. So uh, we know that some disinformation is in the form of uh, slogans, some is hashtags, some is uh, fabricated images, some is memes, but some of it pretends to be journalism. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah. Okay, comment on that then. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, what does the book say after making these clarifications? Sure. I mean, and to pick up on your earlier point, just because you don't like um, news, just because you don't like journalism, does not make it fake. And I think that's something that we, we do need to um, counteract. So bad journalism is not the same as disinformation. Um, and some of the worst examples of um, disinformation involve the manipulation of content, the using of, you know, the, there have been cases with the BBC badge and the CNN badge used on video in the context of elections in Canada, uh, in Kenya, rather, for example, um, as a way of trying to um, pollute the information stream in the context of elections. And what was the second part of your question? So, uh, what is the key message of the book? You've got these clarifications that you don't like the term fake news, you prefer disinformation, there's different kinds of disinformation, some is pretending to be news. Now, what's the message in the book after having made those clarifications? Sure. So the book is aimed at journalists, journalism educators, trainers, um, students of journalism, policy makers, regulators. Um, it's predominantly about equipping people with the capacity to assess information in a way that um, enables them to share information that's verified um, to avoid um, ramping up the disinformation crisis. So we're targeting um, journalists and journalism educators as a way of strengthening journalism in its fight back against disinformation. We believe that collaborative efforts in this regard are absolutely pivotal. Um, but the message is this is not just a challenge for journalists and journalism educators and researchers and governments and platforms. Um, it's all of those things, but it's also a challenge for every citizen. And so media information literacy is absolutely critical um, from the individual sitting at the end of their phone considering um, sending a, a meme or um, a message, um, getting them to ask critical questions that go to the veracity of this information. So we hope that we can broaden the discussion beyond journalism and journalism education to um, a public discussion that recognises that it's a crisis that affects us all and the responsibility to counter it is a shared responsibility. Okay, and what specifically are you saying to journalists? Why should they treat this as a story and how should they treat this as a story? 
because despite what I've just said, <laughs> research, um, particularly recent research from my colleagues at the Reuters Institute indicates that um, significant sections of the community misinterpret um, poor journalism um, or journalism that they interpret as biased as, as disinformation. And so journalists have a responsibility and a need, I would say, to double down on, um, on quality journalism and ethical journalism practice, but also to highlight these issues for public conversation purposes, to shine a light on these issues, to do investigative journalism, like the Cambridge Analytica scandal being um, unearthed, for example, like Rappler in the Philippines did to, um, to join dots between disinformation campaigns and um, the harassment of their reporters. So to use the tools of journalism to ensure that the information that is being produced is able to be produced in a way that allows it to be recognised as reliable and credible and to ensure that um, rather than alienating um, communities and um, increasing polarisation and the absence of trust in journalism, they actually, um, through a process of collaboration, work with communities to tackle the problem. Okay, so my last question is that we're here at the Internet Governance Forum and to what extent do internet governance decisions uh, have to take into account the issues around this disinformation? For example, we see legal, we see laws being passed, we see some companies, internet companies taking actions. I mean, what, what is the relevance of disinformation to internet governance? I think the, fut the future of journalism is tied up um, inextricably with the future of the internet. So this goes to the question around uh, the internet indicators. It goes to um, questions around regulation. Uh, we need to pause and ask ourselves, what is the potential cost of regulating Platform X um, for the capacity to do and publish independent journalism um, more broadly? And what is the risk of these laws that, and, and regulations that we're creating blowing back um, on freedom of expression as it's um, demonstrated through the practice of journalism. So I think um, while this crisis is, is very serious and the manifestations um, are extremely bad at the, at the worst end of the spectrum, we need to um, ensure that while um, working to address an increasingly urgent crisis, we're not actually um, aggravating the problem by undermining uh, the capacity to do independent journalism. Great. So uh, I think the, to sum up what you said, <laughs> internet governance community do no harm to journalism when you're tackling face, uh, fake news and disinformation and do support journalism because it's key if we want an information environment on the internet that is actually going to have something that is truthful and verifiable and in the public interest. Thank you. Tweeted summary. Thank you very much. Bravo, and thank you very much for highlighting all these aspects. Yesterday we had very nice statements and very strong statements about this information and fake news. I think that uh, it is our contribution, at least, our early response to what was said yesterday. And I think that we need to work further. Before closing this session, thank you very much for your, for your uh, coming, for, this, uh, for joining us on this session. I want to thank uh, my colleague, Jiang Hong, who put uh, all this open forum with all these uh, wonderful speakers, wonderful panelists. I thank you very much for joining us, for coming, and please engage with us on these aspects. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.